bay to check that I was okay for tonight. I was doing a, a drawing. It's actually I'm using um, a, a, a materials called silver point, which is much more difficult than normal drawing. I've kind of, uh, you know, at, at this stage I'm kind of fighting with it because I, I feel like I've bit enough more than I can chew. But silver point uh, is using the same materials that were used about. 600 years ago to do drawings before they had invented pencils. They used metal uh, on prepared paper and you could use uh, um, gold or, or uh, mostly silver. Uh, silver was what was drawn with and it goes onto the paper and it leaves um, a, a tarnish residue and you can draw with it. Now I'm drawing something with it which is based on the last time I was able to get to Scotland, which was pre-pandemic. I haven't wanted to fly uh, such a long distance. It's, it's almost um, 20... To get where I live in Scotland, from here in Brooklyn, with the, tr with the train and the plane, it takes something like 25 hours non-stop traveling so it's a, mm -hmm. hell of a, it's a hell of a distance and it's bad enough at normal times but with all these tests and uh, you know masks and everything it would just be an even more arduous trip so i haven't been there since 2019 and when i was there in 2019 this is the, this is the subject matter of today's drawing in silver point when i was there in 2019 this quite famous new york artist who's a friend of mine He'd said during the summer um, that he'd wanted to come up there and visit me. And I said, well, you know, it's, it's the middle of nowhere. Uh, this guy's called Don Perlis. He's a famous Ameri New York artist who paints the kind of life of New York. He's actually 80 years of age now. So he's, he's doing, I mean, he's looking great and he's still painting like a young man. Uh, so he said he's going to come over, and I said, well, you know, there, there's not a lot to do there. I mean, it literally is the middle of nowhere. Um, you, not even the middle, it's the top of nowhere. It's the very top part of the British Isles. There is nothing there. I didn't see an oil painting until I was maybe 16 or 17 years of age, or maybe on a trip to Edinburgh to see my dad's brother. And uh, so there was absolutely no facilities there at all culturally whatsoever. And uh, it really is the last train station on the mainland of Britain. And it feels like it, you know, it really feels like it, like you're in Nowheresville. And last uh, year, the last time I was there, which is 2019, Don Perla said he's coming with his Korean girlfriend. I said, okay, you know, but there's not much to do. You'll just have to, you know... <laughs> or something. Anyway, it turned into a nightmare scenario because other people that he knew started to decide that they wanted to come. And I, I, you know, I don't know what he'd said to them. And I said, well, there's absolutely nothing for them to do. You know, I don't know what I'm going to do with them. So I went to meet them at Wick, Wick Railway Station. And these were people I didn't know. And uh, there was this guy and his girlfriend is, uh, or was, the manageress of Kehinde Wiley. And if you don't know the name, I'll tell you what his recent famous painting was. He was the guy that was commissioned to paint Barack Obama, which is now hanging at the Smithsonian Museum. He's a major, huge artist. He's from Harlem, and uh, he's doing all these huge things. He's had big shows in the Brooklyn Museum. He just had a giant equestrian statue placed in the middle of Times Square. So that's been uh, as a kind of um, counterpoint to the statues of Confederate generals that were down south. You know, he'd created this statue of an um, African-American guy on, on a horse, a huge, about a huge thing, life larger than life. So Kehinde Wiley's manager S is coming, right? And this other guy, and I didn't know it, and I thought, well, you know, what are they going to do? And I met them at the railway station and she got off the train, and uh, I could see in her face, you know, it, it's an eight-hour train journey through nothing but empty countryside to get to this place. 
And when she got off the train, I, I could see the utter chagrin on her <laughs> face. You know, she was she looked not only exhausted, but she looked exasperated. And it, I think it's the only time ever in the history of Wick Railway Station that a vintage, very expensive Louis Vuitton suitcase put itself onto the platform first with her behind it, with the wheels. The suitcase alone is probably more than the annual income of most people in that town. So the suitcase came out first, and then she came out with this face, which was, uh, I can only think of Elaine Stritch sitting on a drawing pin. You know, it was just an excruciatingly... WTF expression. So I <laughs> took the suitcase and tried to help her. I took them to the hotel they were going to. But the drawing I'm doing is based on that experience of meeting these American New Yorkers, you know, real New Yorkers, you know, the kind of the way you visualize them, coming to my place uninvited, you know, I mean, completely unsolicited. I mean, I warned them there's nothing. So I've transformed, I've transformed her. I haven't done her, obviously, as she is. So I don't want to be sued or anything. So I've transformed her into kind of Truman Capote at coming to Wick Railway Station. And, you know, with all his affectations and that voice, eh, well, I like that. And I could just think, well, this would, if Truman Capote came to Wick Railway Station, this is how he would respond. You know, it's like when he goes to Kansas to investigate in cold blood, you know, he's kind of, he's there in Hicksville, and he's such an odd character, standing out like a sore thumb with his, with his expensive clothes, his tiny, diminutive stature, and his strange, kind of high-pitched, Kind of rasping voice, but also very eloquent, and the scarves and everything. So I just saw. I mean, I've transformed her into a kind of Truman Capote coming into Wick Railway Station that I'm doing in a medieval method of drawing, and you know, this is kind of and this is kind of America meets my background, you know, which is what I'm kind of juggling with just now. Uh, but also with ancient European methods of um, creating the artwork. I'm not a commercial artist, you know, I never do anything at all with the uh, concept that this could possibly sell. You know, I mainly do them as uh, catheritic pieces, you know, that I, 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 I feel something builds up inside me and I have to uh, communicate it, you know, and that's, that's, that's the reason the answer behind it. So this is from my last visit to Scotland, 2019, and they also thought that um, they were going to meet Prince Charles, who comes up. That, uh, we did actually encounter him. Uh, he comes up to his grandmother's castle up there every, at the same time as I'm up there in August. And uh, we did encounter him, but it wasn't the meeting. They, they expected that I was best friends with him, and we were going to sit around the castle table, you know, with jugs and tankards of the finest wine. And, you know, it's like like something out of medieval world, maybe, you know, with, with, with roast pheasants, you know. But, uh, we, we, we briefly encountered him, and there was a brief acknowledgement and that was the limit of it because uh, it's nothing it's nothing like the imagination of people but it, uh, where i come from is truly one of the most remote parts of the british island isles uh, it really feels like a place you know that you could imagine yeah. dinosaurs roaming the earth we call people from the west they call people that are born uh, in Wick. Wickers? Oh, the people from Wick? Yeah. They're called Wickers. I mean, they've got, the, the, you know, a Wicker is, um, you know, the, the, um, the place, uh, it had, the, you know, it had its heyday in the um, 19th century. You know, it was the largest herring fishing port in the entire world, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, it was at one time quite rich, uh, and of course it's been a kind of steady decline ever since. Uh, right. 
you know, it, 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 there isn't a lot there. I mean, it's it's um, recently it's going through another decline. I think all the banks in WEC have closed except one. Um, yeah, it's really a, lot of the shops, a lot of the shops have closed and they're being replaced by betting shops, which I don't think you really have in New York. I don't know if you have them in America, but, you know, it's where people go in to place bets on horses. Um, I think they, they had that in New York, the horse track. The horse track. Mm-hmm. Um, Same as that. So there's a lot of that, but... I mean, Britain's going through a kind of upheaval just now. I mean, there's been a lot of shortages of gasoline. And, you know, you've got a double whammy of Brexit and COVID, you know, and it, it's come along. Um, one would have been bad enough, but two is really bad. And uh, I think people are going to be, have a, a very difficult four or five years there, you know, it's definitely changing the um, dynamics, you know, there was a, a lot of people um, in Britain seem to get um, disabilities, you know, and, 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 and I noticed a lot of people who were um, in wheelchairs and on sticks and things like that when I was up, so, you know, I hope that they're not too badly affected by it, you know, because I, I don't know what jobs they're going to be able to do so it's it's kind of uh, it looks like it's going through a very awkward stage in britain just now more so than america america is a huge machine economically and socially uh, britain's a much has become since the war a much smaller machine and less flexible economically so it's it's got a lot more social perks than america like free mm-hmm. medical. Dare, dare, dare I ask your take on a uh, British-Scottish uh, political question? Yes, sure, of course. Uh, second Scottish uh, independence vote uh, referendum. Do you think that'll happen, and which way do you think it will go? It's a good question, and uh, you know the thing is, I, I'm, I'm kind of ambiguous about the whole thing. But, um, uh, of course, I would prefer Scotland to be independent, personally. Uh, yeah, I think it's anywhere that stands on its own two legs, um, even if they're dressed in rags, it's better than, you know, accepting the rich neighbour's hand-me-down trousers, uh, pants, as you say in America. You know, like someone saying, oh, here's a pair that I've worn, you know, uh, here, you can have them. It's much nicer to have your own clothes, even if they're rags than somebody's hand-me-downs. So I would rather be independent, but Scotland is much more, um, you know, they were scared last time by the former Prime Minister of Britain, who was Scottish, Gordon Brown, coming up and making speeches uh, against uh, Scottish independence. And the best way to threaten a Scotsman or a Scotswoman is through the pocket they're very financially and very fiscally minded people, much more than the Irish, which is a, a blessing and a curse. So when he said that, you know, the pound uh, would not be available for an independent Scotland, in other words, you know, we would lose the ability to use... The, we have Scottish pounds, but they're tied in to the bank, you know, the, the main bank in England. So you, we, we have Scottish pound notes that look different from English pound notes, but it's still the same currency. So the idea that you, you would, sub, you know, this is what most average people kind of freaked out with, oh my God, we'll lose our money, we'll lose the pound, uh, we'll all be whatever we'll be, we don't know. I mean, if we go independent in 2014, the first vote, would they get back into Europe? Not, it may not happen so quickly, so there would be this strange kind of time where there'd be no currency as, as, as they understood it. And that's what really scared a lot of people. Now that Britain has exited Europe, because back in 2014, that was not the case, and, and that wasn't even thought to be a, a strong possibility, as, as I understand it. Um, so okay. now, that, now that it has come to pass, do you think an independent Scotland would... Uh, 
uh, attempt to rejoin the EU, and would the EU welcome them with open arms? Right. Uh, first of all, the independent, the, an, an independent Scotland's priority is to get back in the EU as soon as possible. I mean, 63% of Scotland voted to remain as part of the European common market. Uh, the vast majority, in other words, wanted to remain part of Europe. And uh, so, you, you, it's, I mean, I believe for the independence vote, it was 45% voted for independence in 2014 and 55 voted against independence. So these are statistics, but they're important. Scotland would want to get back in the European Union quicker rather than later, but anything in Europe is tricky because it's more than one country. It's not like, you know, that um, North Atlantic alliance thing between Canada, Mexico and North America. It's much more tricky with idiosyncratic countries such as Spain, who have their own independence movement with Catalonia. And there's a great symbiosis between the Catalonians and the Scots. The Catalonians want basically, you know, shot of the rest of Spain and to become an independent country. Um, the, the main uh, the, the um, main section of Spain does not want that at all. If they allowed Scotland to separate from England and become part of the European Union, it would be setting a precedent for the Catalonians. They would say, oh, if Scotland can do it, we can do it. And, and, and that's one of the reasons why Spain, which may have a, an important vote deciding if Scotland gets back in the re European Union, would vote against it. So it's, it's going to be more tricky than people imagine. It's, it's like the current thing that's happening between Northern and Southern Ireland. Northern Ireland is part of Britain. Southern Ireland is an independent country. However, uh, now that Britain has removed itself from Brexit, are they going to start? There was no, you know, there used to be a border between Ireland, North and South, but there has been none for the last, God knows how many years, 20 or 30 years. And uh, so it's been a, a free-flowing border drive back and forth between the South and the North. Now are they going to have to re-establish that because Northern Ireland is now part of the Brexit Britain. Southern Ireland is part of Europe. So it's all very tricky. I've, I've, heard, that, the I've heard that many Northern Ireland, I, I, Northern Ireland uh, people don't want a hard border. Um, even as part of Britain, they don't want a hard border with uh, the European Irish Republic. I don't, yeah, I think you're right. I mean, I don't think anybody would want to go back to that. And, uh, you know, they're not, they're, it's still, you know, it's still a very divided country. I mean, there's still ultra-nationalist loyalists in in the north of Ireland. I mean, they're, they're uh, you know, it's, it's almost, if you ever watch a film about the north of Ireland or you go there, I mean, you know, you could say that America is tribal, but when you get to Northern Ireland, it's truly tribal. It's quite frightening. And for a lot of young men there, it's truly a hopeless life. I mean, I work in the Bronx, and it is not a hopeless life. You know, there's plenty of opportunities. There's plenty of things to do if you if you set yourself set your mind to it. I mean there are things you can do. Manhattan is ten minutes away on the subway and there's umpteen jobs, there's things you can do to get yourself out of any poverty that you might find yourself. But these guys in the north of Ireland, I mean they're just trapped in absolute abysmal poverty and vicious violence, you know, truly horrendous scenes. So uh, I don't think anybody, there'll be some of them want to go back to that fighting because it's an antidote to boredom and they're bored. They're either on drugs or they're bored and, you know, getting back to the troubles of fighting against uh, each other and the British soldiers, that's a great antidote to boredom, you know, and there will always be a few young'uns that want to 
to do that. You know, it gives them that release from the, uh, the dealing with their own boredom, and uh, that's a sad, a sad fact. But uh, back to Scotland, uh, I you know I I do hope that the Scottish find the inner fire to stand alone and and and, and be independent. But uh, you know it, it it was great. The, the Scottish had a good time with the English in the 19th century. You know the height of uh, you know when we created basically the circumstances that have um, made the world what it is now for good and bad, which would be the Industrial Revolution, that was that was the heyday of Britain. I mean, it was the, you know, the, the, the top of the world. I mean, it was spreading its empire <laughs> literally from all over the globe. And uh, that was that was when Scotland was uh, marching lockstep with the English. You know, it really was working out okay for them. It's just gone sourer and sourer. I'd say, you know, after the second, after the First World War, and especially after the Second World War, it's become more and more of a sour union until it just feels like Scotland has gone very much towards a, a more left-wing ideology, a more open society. And the English, um, you can't generalize, but it, it has gone mo generally more right wing and uh, in many ways less friendly towards outsiders. And uh, it's nothing like Trump or anything like that, but it's it's gone much more towards a kind of little Britain, um, small mentality. Um, which I think the Scots don't really have. You know, they, they want to be part of the globe. And, uh, I mean, the, I, the concept of Scotland, of Celts and Haggis and Whiskey, is all a kind of fairly recent invention. You know, it, it's, it's uh, something that was invented by Sir Walter Scott in the 19th century, you know, with his great books like Rob Roy and Waverley and uh, The Heart of Midlothian. All these books created a kind of global... I mean, these were ubiquitously read all over the Americas. I mean, there's still statues of Sir Walter Scott and uh, Robert Burns in in, uh, in uh, Central Park here. I walked past them. I guess 99% of people haven't got a clue who they are. And uh, thankfully, they're not deserving of being torn down because uh, I don't think they did anything horrendous in the past, but uh, the, the modern Scotland was created by Sir Walter Scott, and uh, that vision that we all have is, is a kind of a commercial advert for the country. You know, it's a country of ghosts and castles and legends, uh, guys running around in kilts, uh, you know, and all that stuff. It's very romantic. And uh, I know Americans love it. There's always a steady flow of uh, visitors to Edinburgh and traveling all around every year. But I, I hope that and Scotland has plenty of uh, intelligence, plenty of good workers. It's a large country. If you take Scotland, cut it away from the south of England, and then superimpose it on England and Wales, it's uh, almost the same size as all of England and Wales. The only difference is, thank God, we're not stuck with so many people. There's only about 4 million people in the whole of Scotland, and there's about 60 million of them stuck down there uh, at each other's throats. So, you know, we've, we've got vast expanse, and, uh, you know, a lot of stuff that's being used all over the place. I mean, you, you'd be surprised to know the stuff that's coming out of Scotland, which isn't whiskey or haggis or kilts. They include all the video games which are created in Dundee. These video games are Minecraft, Grand Theft Auto, and all the other things that, like, my students love in the Bronx. They're created in Scotland. You know, all of that stuff is, is done in an industrial estate in the outskirts of Dundee. There's one of my friend's sons works there cr creating these computer programs. So all of this stuff is done there. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a very different society than people uh, over here imagine. I think they imagine it's all a bunch of alcoholics <laughs> screaming at each other and playing football, uh, 
soccer uh, all the time. But I, I hope they can go independent. I think they would be totally successful. The Scottish method has to be to get back into Europe, but a kind of Nordic Europe. Uh, the best countries in the world to live in, uh, I've been to them several times, are places like Norway, Denmark, Finland. Uh, they have the best of social um, provisions, you know, in, within the society. And cohesion. The best education. Cohesion and, and you know, and, and, and it just feels so much safer. I mean, you go to Copenhagen, 90% of people are rushing around in bicycles. And when I say safer, it doesn't mean that they're living abstemious, puritanical lives. They're drinking a lot. There's a place where marijuana is completely legal in, in Copenhagen, Christiana world, you know, everyone's walking around stoned and uh, they're all bicycles, you know, but they're all making a living and they're happy. So it's, it's possible to have that kind of society, but I would like Scotland to go more of a Nordic way, you know, it's up there, it's near Iceland, it's near Nor, it's right in the same latitude as Norway, uh, and it's very close to Finland, it's close to that Nordic cycle, or, or Nor Nordic circle up there and uh, it would be a marvelous thing if we could go like that we have a tremendous problem because of a lack of self-identity and i think it affects men more than women we have a tremendous lack of self um uh, inner self you know which has been removed for years so we have a lot of men who are basically drug addicts alcoholics um, it's, you know, the heart attack capital of Europe. I mean, I think the average lifespan in some places in Scotland, you know, is, is similar to it would be in third world countries uh, because they lack any self-worth, you know, and, and it makes them unable to really look after themselves. They just feel, why not destroy ourselves with a, a, a self-abuse? And uh, you can feel it, especially in people like places like Glasgow. You know, I, I used to work in the maximum security prison that was situated midway between Edinburgh and Glasgow in a hell-forsaken part of the Scottish countryside in Lanarkshire. And the, the name of the prison was called Shots, S-H-O-T-T-S, and it was a kind of brutalist, Stalinist structure created in the 1970s. But... Uh, despite it being midway between the two big cities, 90% of the clients or prisoners were all from Glasgow and they were from housing estates, as you would call here in New York, projects. And uh, these places were prey to the same social kind of dissonance that you get in the projects here. I mean, they were all kind of vandalized people, drug dealing, gangs, violence, the same things go on over there as go on here. Uh, so I had a lot of prisoners from there, and uh, I found three and a half years I worked with them, and uh, some of them were unrehabilitatable, but the vast majority, once they got their teeth into art and good conversations and some different philosophies and things like that. They, they, they were really, uh, they really did some great stuff. And I, I hope, I, I, you know, I haven't kept in touch with them all these years, but I, I, I think some of them did turn their lives around and they uh, transformed. But, uh, you know... Did you have a teacher's pet? Did I have a teacher's pet? Uh, my favorite prisoner was a man called Tam Began, who was... Um, he was a man who'd, uh, he worked for Scotland's Mr. Big, that he was called. He was a, a major drug kingpin. He would be one of Scotland's few billionaires. And he worked as uh, this man, Mr. Big's bodyguard. He was in jail, jail. for, he was in jail for um, um, doing a holdup with a Brinks mat armored car. And he used a bazooka. Yeah. He, I mean, God knows where he got it from because it's hard enough to get a gun in Britain, but uh, they can get them. Anyway, he didn't, he hadn't killed anybody, and he'd been in jail for this armed robbery. And uh, 
I found him a very, I liked him a lot, you know, and we, we, we would chat for ages and he would go on about his days fishing out in and, uh, and, and, and this famous loch, I forgot the name. So we did a re, we got photographs of it and repainted the loch and I got him to do it himself as an imaginary fisherman on the loch. Loch means just, you know, a lake in English. So he was doing all that stuff and it was great for him and he really, you know, he got the bug. He really got into art and I could see it was real for him. And he was an intelligent man. A lot of prisoners were, were certainly, you know, they had an absence of intelligence. But he had an intelligence that could take on board this stuff and use it. And he used his time well in the prison. And uh, he's the only person that got in touch with me after he left the prison, where he was living with a woman in Cumbria, which is in the north of England. And he was making ornamental fireplaces for sale oh. to um, nice country houses. So he turned his life around. But uh, I mean, he had a price on his head. I, I had to teach him in a special wing of the prison for prisoners who were either involved in such strange crimes uh, that they were segregated or that uh, had prices on their heads from other prisoners. And uh, I was in a room working with him at the beginning and there was another prisoner in there and uh, I thought they were friends. And, uh, you know, we were chatting away. They were both quite powerful you know their personalities were quite powerful you could feel it and uh, so I would just play along with them and chat and uh, we seemed to be getting on okay but I found out later that they both were absolute rivals and that there was a good potential that this other guy Gary um, would have killed us if I wasn't there I, I, no one told me about any of this stuff Gary's um, Gary was uh, in charge of prostitutes in Glasgow, amongst his other crimes, and he would do horrendous things to these women um, that really are unrepeatable here on the air. But he was painting uh, laterally a, a huge crucifixion, and the psychiatrist would come in every month and talk to me about what the prisoners were doing, and I, you know, because it was a kind of semi-art therapeutic setup. And I said, well, Gary is painting a crucifixion. And uh, this man said, well, he'll be the only person painting it uh, in this day and age who has first-hand experience. I said, what do you mean? He says, well, he used to crucify people. If he liked you, he would crucify you onto a pool table uh, so that you would be lying there um, horizontally and there'd be no pressure on your arms. You'd just be, you'd be, you'd be, the nail would go through your hands and, and, and feet and you'd just be nailed onto it. If he didn't like you, you'd be nailed up onto a wall so that you would feel the pull of the um, gravity on these nails. So, you know, if I had to go back in and start teaching him this crucifixion, <laughs> I can tell you this, Carol, I mean, after, after that story, I mean, you, you could not look at him and you could not look at that painting with the same eyes. I got God knows what happened to that painting, but uh, I think he's been released. Really <laughs> he did about 12 years, and uh, the other man did about 10 years. But uh, it was fascinating. I mean, now these are people that you would never get, even if you met them in normal life, they would never, you would never know what they'd done, uh, unless you were on the receiving end. So to meet these men and to know or to find out what they've done, uh, it was a unique experience and uh, it really was an eye-opener. But that was an underprivileged part of Scotland where men ended up because I would say, I mean, there were, um, there was a lot, a big element of people who, were, who felt they were living hopeless lives and there's a big element of useless. Um, we call them names. In Scotland, NEDS. NED stands for non educated delinquents. I don't know if they still use that term or if it's become derogatory, but in the, in the 90s, uh, the last time I was there, that was a big phenomenon. And they all wore very cheap clothes called shell suits, and they all had baseball caps turned backwards, and they had umpteen chains around their necks, and they were either drunk or, or, or on drugs all day. 
plays they were and they didn't work and there was a huge population of these guys uh, in Scotland and Glasgow and, and some in Edinburgh and other towns. So it's so like a book about it's like train spotting, train spotting, if you, the film and the book is yeah, very, you know, definitely. I mean it was, it was the AIDS capital of Europe in the 80s, Edinburgh, mm. strangely enough, um, because there were so many junkie and um, drug addicts taking uh, heroin and sharing the needles, and yeah. HIV uh, AIDS was, was spread like wildfire through these needles, um, and they were shooting up left, right, and centre, and it was it was a huge, huge um, epidemic of that in the in the eighties and nineties, and uh, written about by Irvin Welsh in in, uh, in Edinburgh. I think he's. Might I ask you? Might I ask you one more question? I don't know why, about the lines a little bit on nine thirty. And so there's off the air at 10. So if anybody out there has any questions or comments for me, Charles Scott, um, I would like to ask a little question. Please call up area code 216 306 0216. Once again, that's area code 216 306 0216. I just had one more question I asked you before. Yeah. I heard that you were the first Brit uh, to be nominated for a mayor of New York Award for Arts and Culture. Uh, right. That included Woody Allen, Stephen Sondheim, and Charlie yeah, Rosen, yeah. Nancy Williams, James Earl Jones, Lisa Marcellus, and and it was, you were not really invited to teach you at the school where you teach at. Oh, the president of the university. Um, yeah, it was under the uh, mayorship of Bloomberg at the time. Yeah, Bloomberg, yes. I, I was at his uh, uh, Gracie Mansion here. Well, do we have all the nominees together? Yeah, I th yes, we all uh, turned up uh, on this evening, and uh, there was a, a lavish spread. Everything was local. Uh, it was all all the food and the wine. Everything was from New York State. Nothing was allowed to come in from out of it. It was a kind of celebration of New York. New York, New York. So all mm -hmm. everything we ate, everything we drank. It was, it was a very nice night. Very, very, very um, brilliantly lavish, and and um, Bloomberg was speechifying away. And um, <laughs> I can't say I got to know him well, but I did talk to him and shook his hand, and he acknowledged me and all that stuff. But uh, it's like all these mayors, you know, the politicians. You you don't really get to know the real person. But uh, you know, it was a great honour. I was I was flabbergasted, and uh, of course, the British press made more of it than the American press. Um, you know, they were uh, the Sunday Times was following me around for the day, in a, a day in the life of the nominee. I didn't I didn't know what it was called. I was called. I, it had this long, lugubrious title, which was Mayor's Award for Outstanding creative contributions to the life of New York City. It was something like that. It was this huge, long-winded sentence of an award. But I was looking it up recently, and I realized it has a nicer name. It's called the Handel Award. Uh, and I guess the musician, H-A-N-D-E-L. I don't know what he's got to do with New York, but it wasn't the Door Handel Award, which is what <laughs> it kind of ended up as the Door Handel, because I, was, I didn't get it, so I got the Door Handel out. And I can't remember who got the award. I mean, I think uh, I was so... My blood was coursing through my head so much all night um, as one of the nominees. I think I, I kind of partially went blind to my circumstances, and I, I can't even remember who got it. It was, it, was a, it was a wee while. It was about 10 years ago. So I, I, I maybe look it up on the uh, internet. But somebody, somebody famous got it. But I was—I couldn't believe my name was amongst all these um, heroes. Really, you know, Maya Angelou, 
Woody Allen, even Sondheim. I mean, it, it felt ridiculous, but uh, it was a great honour, you know, and uh, in my, uh, hopefully in my little way, I'd, I'd made some uh, worthiness to get this. Uh, I'm sure you did. I'm sure you did. I don't know. I, mean, I, 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 feel, I feel that I do very little, and, uh, you know, but... Uh, you, you know, I, I'm not one of these go-getters or do-gooders, really. You, I, you know, all, I, all, all, I, all, I, all I do is I, I, I really feel that if somebody wants to learn from me and somebody's open to it, I can transform their lives. If they're full of themselves, I always say to the students at the beginning of the class, this is how I start the class. I say, you know, there are four types of students. And then I draw it on the board. I say, they're like Starbucks cups. You have the student who is, the cup is fine. And I, I am the coffee pot giving information, right? So I say, one here is the student, the cup is fine, but the, the cup is upside down. So no matter what information I try to give, it bounces off the cup because it's been turned upside down. That means it's the person who doesn't really want to be with you. He or she is not in the room. They're not there with you. But they're fine. You know, the cup is fine, but they're, they're turned themselves upside down. Then you have another type of student. The cup is fine, but unfortunately, no matter what you pour into it, it just goes straight through and out. They're unable to hold on to what you're saying. There's a hole in the bottom of that cup, so no matter what you put in or say or do, it goes straight in and straight out. Then the third type of student is the most difficult type. Their cup is perfect, there's no hole in the bottom, it's not upside down, but their cup is already full. They already know everything about everything, so they're not open to knowing nothing about nothing. You know, they're just full of themselves. They're already full of coffee. So you, there's, no, there's no space for anything else. They're already full of the thoughts inside their head, the endless stream of yama, yama, yama inside their head. They can't hear what you're saying because all they hear is what's going on inside their own head. And then I say, well, here's the last one. And this one you have to work at being. The cup is fine. It's got no hole in the bottom. It's not full to the top with coffee. And it's not being turned upside down. And you're ready. You kind of make yourself open. And that's the job of a student. It's not how much you can shove into yourself. It's how much you can make yourself open to allow yourself to, to educate yourself. And that's what real education is. Not shoving things in, forcing people to become something else but actually allowing a person to be that vessel that can learn, you know, that, that being that can... Education, you know, I like to unleash people. I don't like to force them to be something. I like to unleash what's inside them. I feel there's creativity inside the, even the most awkward artist, and I have some of them in the class who really have the, you know, the abilities of, of five-year-old children, and, and they're in their mid-twenties. But if I can unleash what's inside them, that potentiality will come out and they'll do the best that they can and they'll become... I've seen people become artists in my class. I mean, we've got one student who was uh, a pupil of mine who'd done no art at all and he's going to be representing America in the Venice Biennale next year. And this is from a community college in the Bronx. The Venice Biennale is the world's most important art Biennale exhibition. You know, it's, it's, you can't go higher. So, you know, it, it, if they're open to it, I can transform them. If they're closed off, if they're upside down, or they've got a hole in the bottom, or they're already full of themselves, then, you know, there's not much you can do. They have to learn how to make themselves receptive to, to learn and to be able to be with themselves and to make themselves educated. That's the job, and 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 that's what that's what the transformation is, and um, that's how I start my classes, you know. And and I think the students recognise themselves. And I said, well, you'll probably find during the time here, you you're all these cups, 
one day you're the full cup, the next day you're the empty cup, the next day you're the upside downer, the next day you're the hole in the bottom because it's life. But as long as you can see that, and as long as you're aware of that, you've got the power. It's when you're completely blind to your own ego-driven um, self-absorption. It's when you're blind to that that you have no hope. But when you can observe yourself and see your limitations, then you have this tremendous strength. And, and that's a strength, of, a real strength, not the strength of bloated muscles and aggression and uh, beating people over the head, but the strength the strength that comes only from inside and, and being awake to one's own vulnerability. That's the greatest strength that you can ever have. And that is uh, that's that's what I that's what I, I, I teach them. Nothing else. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting that your parable of the, the coffee cup is similar to Jesus Christ parable of the and the same thing is on various types of soil. Remember that? Uh, I didn't quite catch the words there. Sorry, the lines about that, Carl. Did you say that? I'm, I'm sorry. He's catching uh, the what? The parable of the coffee cups is similar to that of Jesus Christ in the parable of going to see the various types of soil. Yes, I mean, it's, 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 you know, there's a lot of um, similarities. You know, the, you know the, I, I would say, you know, the, um, you know, the, the idea of Jesus is, is um, to really uh, somehow, if, if one can become less centered on oneself and able to, to take away all the meaning of one's thoughts that they're so important, take away all the meaning of, of things that we see and things that we react to that they're so important, and, and see all this um, so-called um, world that we're in as, as essentially meaningless. I, uh, you know, I, I know it might um, disturb some of the listeners, but I also feel you know, that perhaps he was using... Um, Ideas from Buddhism and things like that. And, and I always thought that it was reincarnation of the... Yes, I mean, it's, it's probable, you know, and uh, it's just come out in this different way that the West needed to have a, a, a you know, to reiterate Gary and his crucifixion, that needed to have, you know, this symbol of pain to, to, to make it uh, something that they could um, relate to. Uh, pain is a great relator to... Uh, when I was young, I was always interested in WIC, you know, because because there was no culture uh, as such, you know, there was no art galleries, there was no museums, there was absolutely nothing. So if you were a young, creative, intelligent guy, you would turn on the local population for your creativity. So I was always interested in older people and their, you know, I was, I was always thinking, what on earth are they talking about in the streets, you know, in these long, absorbed and very intense conversations? I said, they must be talking about the meaning of life. They must be talking about life after death. They must be talking of something that's so profoundly interesting that it's absolutely absorbed them. Then I realized as time went by, they're mainly talking about their aches and pains. <laughs> oh, I've got a sore back. I've got a sore eye. The leg's going to the doctor sees this and the doctor says that. And of course it absorbs them 100% because they're trapped in their bodies. You know, they've made their bodies their entire raison d'etre, you know, they believe that they are their bodies, they believe that they are their minds, they become these things, and as we get older, we become more absorbed in being these things, you know, it becomes more of this kind of, almost like an imprisonment, you know, my God, you know, here I am, you know, and it's heading towards, as you asked me at the beginning, you know, will it be... Um, uh, cremation or, or burial, of course, it doesn't really matter. I mean, I, you know, I only answered it as a kind of, as a kind of uh, to, to give an answer, but it doesn't really matter because it's what's here at this moment. It's what the being is is at now, not not occurs post mortem. That's important. It's the state of being of 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 one's 
mm-hmm. intrinsic being as of now, you know, rather, rather than the, the series of aches and pains and the narrative. I've got somebody in Scotland wanting to write my biography. And he's mm-hmm. doing all this. He's somebody who's known me for years, you know. And, uh, you know, he's saying, you know, the thing is, David, you know, I, I, you know I, there was a time not so long ago, when I really was invested entirely in my biography. I mean, I had I had this huge scrapbook of press cuttings going as far back as 1963 when I was on the front page of the newspaper up there in Scotland for this Walt Disney Award as a wee whippersnapper of uh, five or six, five years old. So, you know, it was a vast book, and, and the book had almost become like my... Um, my Bible, you know, this was, oh, look at this, if I croak tomorrow, I've got this huge book of press cuttings showing how important I am. And you know this, uh, it's, I, I, in fact, I've mislaid it, I don't even know who the, the thing is. The entire idea of my being as my narrative has really ceased. You know, it, it, it was before a series of stories, a series of great an- anecdotes, and I do have an interesting story, but I am not my story. And I, I you know, I tried to explain this to my friend. You know, I said, you know, it's it's it, it's interesting what you say, and you can put all this story into it. But essentially, I I don't see myself as that story any longer. I mean, it, it's it's a nice story, and the working with the prisoners, the the the, the Scottish man, all this la di da la di da la di da. But essentially, that's not me. You know, it, it's a story. It's it's something from the past, and it's interesting, but it's it's not what I'm about at all. Uh, something has transformed, and uh, it's an ongoing process. But that story, which I was so, so invested in, I had an entire exergesis of uh, you know doing various jobs to learn about. Um, Suffering, old age, and death. You know, the, the suffering was with the people with brain damage and the people with no arms, people with MS, people with diseases. The, the death was working in the graveyard, and the, the, then there was evil was working with the prisoners and working with this. This um, I worked with old people in the home as well, so that was the old age. So I had this entire story about what I was doing in my life. And it, you know, it, it, it was good. It, it was interesting, but uh, essentially, it's not really that important. You know, it's just something that is easy to latch on to for the mind, but it, it's not. It's not the vitally important thing uh, that it seemed to be. And uh, I, I don't. I don't <laughs> well, I, you may say that, you know, but, uh, I, you know, the, the problem is it's, it would probably be unreadable. Um, <laughs> my uh, my abilities at speaking are okay, but my, my grammar and my punctuation and such, like, you know, I'd be picked up by every pedant and pulverized. Uh, you know, it wouldn't be that great a book. And uh, I believe that during the pandemic... There is going to be a tsunami. I was reading in the Financial Times last week. A tsunami of autobiographies are being written. And they're largely childhood autobiographies by every Tom, Dick, and Harriet. uh, At least (laughs) probably in America. So, you know, I would be reluctant to contribute to that mountain of unreadable You know, the thing is, uh, Carol, I often think, you know, in a hundred years, I mean, who is going to be bothered about that biography? In a hundred years, who, I mean, uh, take the greats of a hundred years ago in America. They're either now politically so incorrect that nobody would even dare to think about reading their stuff, or they've been forgotten. And, you know, you you have to look at it like that. I mean, if you watch, and I watch old films on YouTube of... um, New York in um, 1901 or something like that. And now they've found ways of speeding up the film 
so that yeah. you know in, in the old days oh. they used to walk and then to Charlie Chaplin but the, the, the ability to yeah. digitally correct and speed correct is is truly it's amazing <laughs> it's amazing and they look like normal people instead of these kind of strange silent movie caricatures but you you know you also think to yourself, well, they're, they're, look, that joker's just like somebody I met yesterday there he is but he's been dead for a hundred years <laughs> And, no and, one knows and, about and also, you, you mentioned these biographies, uh, these autobiographies from a hundred years ago. Yeah. Thank God for the Gutenberg project. Um, there's a lot of, uh, you know, they they basically publish uh, public domain uh, writings. So so uh, a, a lot of uh, autobiographies, a lot of uh, historical books that uh, don't have copyright. They they're long past copyright and uh, available. They're available. Um, there's, well, uh, uh, do, do, do people read them? <laughs> well, uh, some they do, some they don't. Um, and, you, and you can see how many downloads a particular book has got. Um, well, one book that I found pretty fascinating, um, and it's from about 105 years ago, around 1915 or, or thereabouts, and it was, uh, I think the title was something along the lines of The, the Personalities of American Cities from the perspective of, of 1915. So, um, you know, they're, they're, they're like just different chapters where, where the, uh, the writer sort of gives his impressions and, and, and talks to people and sort of gives you a sense of the personality of, of the different cities from the perspective of 100 years ago, uh, including uh, Montreal and Toronto and Canada as well. But, um, you know, mostly northeastern cities and, and actually San Francisco's in there as well, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, that no, that that does sound interesting. So it's it's not, I mean, it's not so to speak an individual autobiography. It's it's the biography of cities. So. Well, that that one that one isn't an autobiography, but I guess one could look at it as an autobiography. But there are there are autobiographies uh, among the uh, the um, you know books for download on that site. Gutenberg dot yeah, no, org, I think it is something like that. It's a, well, a good name for it. I mean, you, you can't <laughs> you can't go further back. Than, but uh, yeah, no, that, it, it is. You know, it, it's fascinating, and um, you know, I certainly um, would. Uh, I'll try to look at that internet uh, thing. I'm interested in the biographies of the cities. More, more uh, I will me. send I you a link I, I, if I can get an email from Carol later on after the I'll, show. I'll get uh, that. Would be fine. Yeah, that, yeah. I'd love that. Thanks. Uh, it, mm -hmm. uh, it's not often I read autobiographies. I've got to say that. Uh, fact, mm -hmm. A lot of them are bullshit. Last, well, that's the problem, you know. I mean, I feel I, I'm one of these people that largely reads nonfiction. I mean, it's a failing. Uh, I had a friend of mine from Liverpool telling me that I should really get into some fiction, but uh, I, I, you know, I feel that I'm wasting my time. Um, there's so much that I want to read that's non-fiction um, that uh, you know it, 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 I, you know I feel like I'm really doing a lot of work well, reading that. There, there's a lot of uh, badly written fiction uh, passed off as autobiographies. <laughs> well, yeah, I think I've known some people who've written those. An emphasis on, on 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 badly written. Yeah, well, it would be. I mean, that, well, I think that's what would happen to me. A, you know, when Carl was saying I should write my, yeah, I think mine would be a badly written autobiography, and I don't want to contribute more to the some of human suffering. You know, something <laughs> that, you know, I think it would be, I, I, it would be just. Um, I mean, it, there'd be interesting points in it, but you know, I, the thing, the, for me, the, the, the feeling is, what is the point? You know, I mean, is it just an ego trip, or am I of such importance that I imagine this autobiography is going to be fundamentally crucial for people to read? Or is it this legacy thing, you know, that you always have to have this so-called um, clutch at immortality um, as you get older, you know, and you think you've lived this important life? And I, I, I don't have that feeling really about it at all. I mean, I, I'm happy enough to have manage to exist as an artist against the odds coming from the highlands of Scotland with without coming from um, 
financially independent family situation, you know, quite the opposite, uh, which makes it virtually impossible to live as an artist. So, uh, you know, I'm quite happy that I've managed to exist all these years doing this, you know. I'm sure they would love to read your autobiography compared to my autobiography. We have a I don't know, you know, I mean, I, you know, you could, I mean, there's an autobiography of, I mean, there was a man who wrote a biography, he was injured in a sword fight, and uh, he had to spend weeks in bed, uh, I can't I remember if it was France or Germany, and that's a fascinating, you know, it, it, it's what you make out of it, I mean, I guess, you know, you could, you, you could have an autobiography and do nothing. And in, in your entire existence, it would be the most fantastic. And you, or you could have an autobiography of some bugger who's running around the world um, doing everything imaginable, and it would be utter rubbish. You know, it's, 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 it's the human being can transform the most mm -hmm. circumstances into the most fascinating, and vice versa. I mean, I've read biographies by people who've done a hell of a lot, and it's just rubbish. <laughs> we have about, about six minutes left. Is there anybody on the line who wants to ask a question? Is there anybody on the line who wants to ask a question? It's area code 216-306-0216. Well, listen, um, I'd be interested to know if anybody's actually listening, but... I, I can tell you that there are people listening online. We've had uh, people call in on the phone, and then when they heard uh, you in conversation with Carol, and, and, and um, they, they dropped off after a couple of minutes. But uh, there, are, there are definitely listeners online. I can, I, I can see how many... I well, that's good. It's, yeah. it's never good to reveal the number, but uh, I can see that there is a number. Oh, no, no. Oh, that, that, well, that's good to know. Yes, maybe they thought it was a, a normal uh, call-in program. But, uh, well, and, and, uh, but I also uh, think that they, they, they didn't want to... Um, they didn't want to, uh, you know. They, they were they, they were listening to what you were saying and, and and were interested by it and didn't want to interrupt with uh, something inane. Well. You know that's very kind of them. You know, cause I, 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 it's a, it's nice to be able to to uh, get into the flow. And um, you know, I was I was watching people talking on the internet. You know, and I'm always I always admire people who are doing talks who can deal with constant interruptions. You know, if they if they're involved in it. You know, and uh, I mean, I think I've learned it a bit teaching over the years because there's quite often. There's always at least one or two students, anyway, who who cannot remain silent and 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 able to listen to you when you're talking, and they must always impose their values on you, um, whether it's through fear or the need for control. They must impose a value, and uh, over the years, uh, at the beginning, I just find it very annoying. Over the years, I've learned to, to just kind of take the bull by the horns and instead of turning it into a bullfight, turn it into a dance. And uh, it, it's tricky. But, uh, it's, it's the only way you can do it because most people want to control you. Most of my time is spent trying to defuse the mind and, and stop it being in control all the time, uh, dominating circumstances. So a lot of my talks and a lot of my teachings and a lot of my work is, is really about setting traps for the mind so that the mind is no longer in control of life. And uh, of course, when you do that, you immediately set off people's minds, which become defensive because they are survival mechanisms. And uh, they kind of clamp, clamp shut like crabs and try and stop you. So quite often you have these kind of battlegrounds where you deal with people's minds. The mind wants to be in control. The mind likes to dominate and the, the mind likes to really uh, have things the way it wants things to be. So anything that uh, threatens that status quo causes fear and um, immediate kind of repulsion and, and attack sometimes. 
so it's it's always tricky. I always feel like I'm I'm, I'm walking in a minefield or a mi- mind field when I get into my subjects. There's there's one or two. Somebody filmed me doing. I used to do talks on this kind of stuff in Scotland, and I think there's one or two of them. They were filmed. I think the the, the talks went on for at least an hour. And they filmed 10 minute extracts that on YouTube where I talk about suffering, old age, and death, and the mind, and things like this. Yeah, I mean, it's from a while ago, and uh, it, it's interesting to see now, you know, that uh, I've evolved in different directions slightly, but it, it was from a period where I was, I was doing a lot of that. And, uh, so that's a sort of Is that sound good? It would be interesting. Uh, so 